So the basic idea here is taking a sort of pattern in which you define your program as a set of capabilities. And traditionally, you sort of might parameterize those over a monad stack. So concrete example, you have logging. And let's say, well, you're, I can make this bigger if you want. No, it's not. Space back is using commands. All right. Uh, command. Yeah, is that visible to everybody? Yes. Yeah. Um, cool. So, basic idea you might have some capability, for example, logging, right? That gives you the ability to take, and it's defined as a data instance logging. And here it's uh, parameterized over constraint, but like introducing the simple concept first. You might have, a, uh, have the ability given a string to log a string in some monad stack, and you would have your logging data instance parameterized over um, that, mo that concrete monad stack. Now instead, what you can do with data.constraint is that gives us the ability to talk about constraints at like sort of the type level. So what you do instead is you create uh, data logging, and it's parameterized over the constraint, this being something, anything really that has like the kind of monad that has a kind of star star, to a constraint, right? So you have logging has the ability to log info for all m, where m is parameter or m is constrained by m c this constraint. You have the ability to take a string and uh, get like an m of unit, where presumably you're logging the string. Maybe you're throwing the string away and test whatever, right? And what that looks like is down here I O logging. So you can uh, take you can, and this is like in REPL. This copy pasted from a REPL. I didn't want to attempt the demo gods by doing it live. Uh, <laughs> so you have log info. You just lift your I. You have a string. You're prepending info to it. You put string line. You lift I O. That gives you something. And I have the REPL open elsewhere. If anyone has questions, I can drop into that later. But uh, yeah. So the type of that um, type of log info applied to I O logging is just a function of anything with that constraint to string. Any monad with that constraint, you give it a string, it gives you like a monadic action in that constraint. And you run it with test message, it logs test message. So far, so simple. Uh, let's add, yeah, the REPL is going to be like way too small to see with this. So the goal of this is to, uh, if you're familiar with the reader TN sign pattern, you basically have a bag of capabilities, that's your env, and you run everything in IO reader TN. Reader T and bio. Uh, and the problem, one of the problems with that is if you want to parameterize any of those capabilities over the monad stack containing the reader T, you end up with an infinite type because you can't refer to like the end which contains your capabilities, which refers to the, well, kind of, you might run, you run I think it's probably possible somehow. You use like a type level fixed point, it's, it's a thing. It's not a thing I want to deal with. Uh, <laughs> right, so this is what this looks like when you have all of the pieces sort of come together. Uh, here you have just the standard um, NFT boilerplate. Essentially, you just have a class which you parameterize, which you use to in, uh, assert that your environment has this thing by providing a lens into it. You have your actual capability, which is parameterized over the string. And what you can do is you can construct an instance of monad logging where you're saying, Anything where I have an environment with logging with some set of constraints, I have a reader into that environment in M, and that M is also constrained by whatever requirements these are. I don't care what they are. Like at this point, we barely even said this is a monad, right? Like we might not have. Like uh, it just has to have something of that kind and that constraint applied that kind. Now, simple example as before, right? Slightly different, uh, not in any important way. Logging monad IO, it has log message capability with IO, push string. This is prefix with log message. It's, uh, this, I threw this together yesterday and like did these sli uh, not slides and only found out I was doing this when I learned that Greg Field is sick, which I'm super excited to present and was looking forward to this talk. But uh, yes, this happened. So, metrics then. That is built on top of logging, monad logging. Still pretty simple. Uh, this is a mock metric. It has the same boilerplate. Now it has increment counter capability, where it just takes a counter name, which is like just a new type around uh, some string, increments that. And again, you have the same pattern. You ask for the capability from your surroundings. You apply the function. And then you just like uh, apply that function from the capability to the arguments. Same as with logging, right? So this time it's not it's not implemented in terms of just monad IO. It's implemented in terms of monad logging, right? Because this is a mock metrics class, and the idea is you're throwing a service together. You don't yet have metrics implemented. You want to just log all your metrics increment operations to the command line, or sorry, not the command line, to standard out or wherever you're logging stuff. It doesn't need to be standard out. It just has to have that logging capability. 
So what you can do then, that's still pretty simple. Each of those is built on top of one constraint. They're not built on top of like a list of constraints. Uh, data store, right? And as is traditional for minimal applications to prove a point, um, it's a to-do application. So what you can do is you can write a to-do, and a to-do is it's in a different it's in a different uh, file. A to-do is just a body and uh, or a name and a body and you can read all your to-dos and just get a list of them. Now, this is also parameterized over an error type to demonstrate that you can also do this. Because normally, like, your application code doesn't really care what the error type is. It just cares that there's some error. And if you're doing this in Redis, you might have one error type, Postgres, another error type, et cetera, right? The error type is often going to be specific to whatever you're running it in, and tying it to a concrete error type is, like, excessively constricting. Anyway, so same boilerplate, has data store, monad data store. Then you have your instance again, and it's using the exact same pattern. You're grabbing the data store capability, you're grabbing the field from it, and that's giving you a function of like whatever your constraint is on a monad stack to like some operation in that monad stack. Now again, in Impl, right? So this has like a bunch of artifact, semi-artificial stuff in it just to prove out different capabilities. So you're logging a message, you're attempting to write a to-do, uh, completely arbitrary validation, you can't have heck in the body of any of your to-dos, it log this as a Christian server, no swearing, this was somewhat late at night when I came up with this, increment a data store errors message, give you a mock data store error, which is the data, the error type that's parameterized over, uh, else it'll write it to the IO ref. Oh, sorry, this is just built off an IO ref. This is, again, just a proof point. It's not production ready anyway. Um, and I'll increment a counter for your writes. Reading to do's is very similar. Um, it just uh, has an artificial error condition. Again, if you have more than three messages, it has like IDK buffer overflow or something and gives you an error. Otherwise, it just gives you the messages. Right, so, so far, hopefully this is somewhat clear. You're defining things in just in terms of the capabilities that the monad reader stack that they're in has to implement. If you're familiar with F, this should be like somewhat familiar because instead of defining something in terms of the capabilities that the interpreter stack on in which it is run has to implement, it's defining things in terms of the capabilities that like the bag of capabilities, the environment of the reader T has to implement. So I have some business logic defined using this. It is similarly like not super Complete, but or not 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 complete, but similarly like artificial, right? So this do biz logic accepts the back to, or accepts the list of to dos, does some validation, drops the invalid, logs them, writes all valid, gives you the new state, and it all is returning either. And I was going to refactor this to use like XFT or whatever as the comment says. I did not do so. So what it's doing is just traversing over the list of to dos. It's validating each of them. It's uh, writing this to do it valid. It's dropping them with the is logic error. If it's not, and then you have your errors. Uh, and it either, uh, yes, awful valid variable names, I know. And if you succeeded, you read all the to dos out. And if it's a left error, you just propagate that error. And then you can get an error from read all to dos too. Right? Uh, invalidate is just checking that the description of the body are not null. Um, and you've got some boilerplate here where you're just, uh, you have your environment, which is you have your logging, metrics, data store, each parameterized over a set of constraints. And then you're just, these can be auto-generated. There's like a template Haskell to do it that I haven't tried here yet. And then you have a with end function that just does some stuff. It uh, constructs the IO ref necessary for the data store. It runs some function in an environment that requires the end. That's done here. And it's just using the reader T to provide the end to everything. So walking through the logic that's being implemented here. Task one, it's like writing is due. Task one, do that thing, to do malform. The second one is going to be dropped because of validation. Doing the biz logic, uh, log the message with the results of that. To do is two. Task two is like valid. Task three is oh heck, that's going to get caught because of the uh, swear filter. Um, res two, print logs. To do is three. Task three, task four, which is fix the buffer overflow inside of task three. So that's going to fail. Logs everything. And this is where I try to figure out how to change the size of my terminal in real time. Yes, that is probably too small. Let's drop this into Emacs, which is slightly larger. Uh, font size. I like just got this laptop like two days ago. I'm switching to a uh, Linux laptop. I'm super excited about it, but it involves some, uh, some startup time. as Emacs is worth it. Um, yes. So you can see, first time it attempts to write the to-do, the to-do, it wrote, it writes it, you get your mock metrics, you increment the counter name, biz logic error for the second to-do, or because it's not formed as log at the biz logic level, data store, you're then reading all of them, you have your results, 
uh, then again, you're attempting to do it right for like tasks two, it succeeds, task increments counter name, task three, writes it, oh heck, data store logs, error, no swearing, curse the server, <laughs> that's uh, whatever. Um, then you increment your data store errors, you get your left error from that, and then you attempt to write the last like three and to do three and four, write three succeeds, write four succeeds, then the incredibly artificial buffer overflow error happens because you have task size of tasks over three. Um, oh no, the buffer flow error happens slightly later when you attempt to read all of them, you log that, and then you have that there. Boom, then you have your result buffer overflow. This is five minutes left, or? Yeah, five minutes left. Awesome, that went through that pretty quickly. Uh, yeah, so the basic idea is that um, you don't need to run into the potential infinite type error that you would, or issue that you would get while trying to define your monad stack in terms of the reader T, which like your thing parameterized over that monad stack is in. Um, I showed this to someone, they said it was very similar to uh, something Matt Parsons wrote in like 2014, the rank and classy limited effects. And I'm not sure if that's true or not. I haven't read that article yet. Uh, yeah, so mainly this is a showing the interesting technique of parameterizing things over constraints and sort of sketching out one potential way of where we could go from that. I have like a REPL open with some of this code, with all this uh, code loaded. If anyone has any questions or anything they want me to like dig into. Uh, yes, questions? Right. Is the code on GitHub? Uh, it is, yes. Uh, it's at um, P. Kinsky, sorry, that's my name, Paul Kinsky. Um, it's P. Kinsky slash constraint reader. Um, yes. And this is uh, it's sort of like basically an attempt to sketch out a different way of managing dependencies between different services that uses data.constraints in what seems like a cool way. And cool, if no one has any other questions, we can go on to the next person.